The following is a presentation of the Four Center podcast feed. From the center of the galaxy, this is the Four Center podcast feed. I'm Ken Napsok. I'm Joseph Scrimshaw. And I'm Jennifer Landa. And we are here, all three of us together in this busy holiday season to talk about breaking news from a long time ago. Some days it's crazy busy weeks. Bob Iger's walking around Disneyland plus, uh, f- uh, pressing the flesh at uh, other times. <laughs> 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 disturbing image. <laughs> uh, other, than, other times it's smaller news. We're going to get to it. Uh, all today. And before we do that, we're going to remind you that today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30 day free trial at audibletrial.com slash four center. Over 180,000 titles and growing to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. As always, a little bit later, we have our four center recommends an audiobook we think you should try out on us. And yes, uh, I loved watching Iger on uh, Instagram photos and stories, just walking around Disneyland in a casual top. <laughs> just shaking hands and taking photos. Fascinated by it all there. I hope he's uh, asking each individual person, is this too expensive? Uh, are your children no longer going to college? Is that what's happening now? Do you uh, do you like the turkey leg? Is it too much? Is it too little? <laughs> too little indeed. Uh, before we get to the news, we always like to catch up. But also, we're going to start off here strong here. This has been going really, really well. We appreciate your support. We're asking people, hey, would you consider going over to YouTube and subscribe to the Force Center YouTube channel if you haven't already? Uh, we are asking uh, nicely, but humbly, uh, we, we want some help to grow and we got some cool things coming and we are trying to get to 7,000 subscribers. We went for 6,500 to Joseph. We blew past that. I think we're going to do we're going to do this. I believe. I believe it worked really well to to start with a reasonable ask. And now we're shooting for the stars of 7000. <laughs> yeah, we got some cool things planned uh, like we uh, keep teasing, but uh, some YouTube only stuff. And we'll continue to rebroadcast the podcast and the live Q&A's over there as well. Uh, before we get into news, we always like to catch up. Uh, busy time, busy season. Uh, Jen, uh, we'll start with you. Star Wars and Life Adventures. Yeah, I realized last week we didn't talk about um, our Star Wars adventures when I recorded with you guys. So I'll use one from a week and a half ago. <laughs> uh, I took my kids to uh, Golden Apple Comics. Um, yeah, it was really fun. I wanted to get my daughter, you know, more motivated to be reading more. And I was like, oh, I have some ideas about some comics you might like. I just thought the experience would be really fun for her. So we took the whole family there. They were having a sale. And it's nice because you walk right in and the kid section is right there. And there were so many to choose from. Hmm. A lot of Star Wars stuff in the kids section. In fact, I found what I was looking for, which was um, <laughs> Tales, Tales from the Rancor Pit. Uh, I still have to crack that open, um, but I'm excited to read that. And she picked up uh, I forget, Amethyst of Gem World and wow. Seed of the Space Girl and some sweet, there's like a Sweet Valley High one comic. My daughter, my three-year-old got a mini mouse comic book which she's obsessed with it was just a wonderful experience and they saw r2 on top of it so it was great that is great i have been meaning to go to that comic book shop for um eight years so i'll get there soon (laughs) super friendly you know i remember back in the day where it was not so friendly um Mm -hmm. as a as a young woman and i took my kids there and they everyone was so helpful what do you need everything going okay and i just it was such a welcoming place it made me feel made me feel so hopeful yeah that's great yeah yeah that's no absolutely we we keep talking about that here the 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 word nerd and the words nerd and geek meant something different and then uh you know uh, a young lady walking into a comic shop was a different experience than it was now hopefully it's not perfect right that's great that's great fun passing down the star wars loved and generation behind you uh joseph uh uh, have you been busy passing down Star Wars love? Is that what you've been doing? Uh, no, I don't. If, if I've passed Star Wars love, it has been accidentally. Uh, <laughs> like a virus? I don't think so. I don't know. I don't like where this is going, so I'm going to back out. Beep, beep, beep. Backing up noise. Uh, no, things have been good. It's been a busy couple weeks. Yeah, we didn't catch up on Life and Star Wars Adventures last week because we did our, our breakdown of the first season of Andor, which was great. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have been extremely busy with holiday stuff and a couple different short film things there's uh one that i'm trying to edit that i shot on my phone another one that's a uh, like 
like mm. peace fight, like the one I did with Ken and Mark. Um, I'm trying to find time to edit that. Uh, but I'm also uh, working with some uh, mutual friends of, of ours, Ken, mm-hmm. on uh, a short film that is uh, not going to go up on YouTube right away because I'm going to submit it to film festivals. Hey. Um, and I'm kind of doing everything. It, the, the phone films are like a, a fun sort of like, I'm just going to see what I can do uh, myself <laughs> with pals mm. yeah. <laughs> in my okay. living room, maybe in hotel rooms. Um but this is this one I'm doing like everything exactly the right way with the permits and insurance and SAG and boy, Ooh. I'm filling out lots and lots of paperwork. Mm. Um, but I'm very excited for it. It's coming up. We're we're doing the shoot on December 18th, so that's taking up uh, a ton of my uh, my energy and, and headspace. Mm. Uh, and then the Star Wars adventure that is helping me, and and I'm uh, trying not to get too distracted, is my Rebels rewatch, which uh, mm-hmm. I've mentioned a couple times, and I kind of kept setting it aside of like at some point, Force Center will do a deep uh, review of mm-hmm. Rebels, and we would love to, but time yeah. is is such a a challenge right now. And I just decided, like, hey, I sit down and I eat my English muffins and drink my coffee every morning. I'm just going to sit at my computer. I'm going to watch one, sometimes two episodes of Rebels. And I have been enjoying it so much. It's such a huge reminder to me as a Star Wars fan to it's one thing to experience something as it's coming out, uh, waiting week to week, going through all of the the Star Wars discourse, which is often so fun, but it can also sometimes be challenging. My my uh, viewing of Rebels started off a, a little rocky because I had just fallen in love with the Clone Wars and I was a little resentful <laughs> of Rebels. Uh, and it's so fun to go back and see it and fully appreciate it. I'm right at the beginning of season three. So uh, mm-hmm. Tom Baker, the fourth doctor is the Bendu is just oh. uh, just unspeakably great uh, yeah. to me. I'm I'm loving it so much. Everything that's Ezra's journey is like the uh, the uh, uh, antithesis to Luthen's speech, which is really fun to think about. Mm. Uh, it was amazing to watch the first season, and it, it the first season is just chock full of like it, it, it's okay. Star Wars is back. Here's all the themes you know. Here's original trilogy characters. Yeah. It, it's so funny to think of how uh, how annoyed people would be by the first season of Rebels if it was broadcast right now. Mm. Uh, so there's all these different uh, ways to see it uh, fresh watching it again and, and being able to not have to wait a week, but just, you know, hit, hit play yeah. right away on the next one. So join it so very much. I love that. I, th- I think that might be on my list next to pick up against. I, I was, I got through season two on a rewatch and then you and I started the Clone Wars report. And I was like, well, I just don't have, this has to go. I have to watch Clone Wars again. Now, <laughs> it's fun. And, and, and you and I are coming down the end of that road. I'm going to be rewatching season seven. So I might pick it up. I just did a very long 15 season rewatch of it's always sunny in Philadelphia, which is a different <laughs> podcast. Entirely. Uh, but that's my treadmill show, you know, you, you yeah. the treadmill yeah, yeah. and rebels was that. So I think uh, rebels is up next and uh, it just completed Andor. And for, for me that my Star Wars adventures last week have been pretty, pretty almost null and void. I had one of those weeks, which it's kind of refreshing. And I think that's, we, every once in a while, one of us three will have that where it's like, you know what? I didn't have a lot of Star Wars last week and Star Wars wasn't in my life. And you know what? That's okay. Cause you take a breath and then mm-hmm. you dive back into the pool. Uh, but it is, uh, Andor is, uh, is a show that inspires conversations, which is one of the things I love so much. So, uh, we had the Mark Ellis comedy special taping this weekend. Got to see, uh, Joseph smiling face there the, on that mm-hmm. Saturday as well. And um, fun experience and, and, you know, stressful, but also uh, fun and, and rewarding. Uh, but during the time, a lot of people, hey, I haven't seen you a bit. I've been, I, I've been meaning to ask you about Andor. Like, and, <laughs> and, that, and that's always an interesting conversation to start. But it, it's generally so positive, but uh, just kind of leads to wonderful conversations about Star Wars out there. But other than that, I, I, I kind of took a break from Star Wars. And that's okay. Mm-hmm. That's okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. You got to leave room for some other things and then Star Wars will uh, be enriched by you taking a break. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it will indeed. But uh, yeah, just talking about Rebels and, and, and how it connects to Andor and the, uh, you know, you, you would experience that Joseph rewatch in season one. So it's been fun to when, when people ask me about Andor to just highlight the themes that are present everywhere. And let's talk about it. It's a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. All right, we're going to dive into some Star Wars news here. Uh, if I can get my notes up. Oh, iPad has too many codes to get in. There we go. All right. Uh, headline of the day begins with Mando Returns. The Mandalorian, Mandalorian Season 3 pre- premiere date has been announced. This year's Comic-Con experience in Brazil was the source of many exciting trailers, which makes me think maybe that's why I took a week off from Star Wars. I was an Indiana Jones fan for <laughs> 
Uh, we can talk about that on on uh, Indiana Jones Center. Uh, but uh, yeah, the Comic Con in Brazil, many exciting trailers and news new drops, uh, news drops, including the announcement that the third season of The Mandalorian will be dropping on March first. There had been some. Is it February, January? Yeah, they moved it. Uh, we didn't know, but now we know. So just simply, hey, what are our thoughts on this release date, Jennifer? I am glad it's in March because I thought it was going to be in February. That's what I thought. Or like you said, January. I didn't know. I need time to recoup from the holidays, <laughs> from Andor. There's still so much that I want to explore with Andor. I want to rewatch it. Um, and obviously, Bad Batch is going to be coming up. So yeah. I want to be able to enjoy that. Um, it will be interesting about them overlapping because I do think yeah. Bad Batch has a good size audience, but Mando is going to reach a much larger audience for yeah. sure. Um, and it could put a damper on Bad Batch's finale, or it could just mm-hmm. be like, you know, this, that corner of the Star Wars fandom that just appreciates it, enjoys it, and is able to juggle multiple <laughs> Star Wars things. Yeah. Um, and also, the Mandalorian will be going on when Star Wars Celebration happens in oh. April of this year. So there's a lot of Star Wars overlapping. Yeah. Oh, that's that. Yeah, I forgot about that. Oh. <laughs> Me too. Um, yeah. And the sub question is Bad Batch possibly overlapping. We got Bad Batch starting soon. And that that sends us into questions about uh, is animation lower on the tier? And you know what? I think the reality is it is. And that that's not a slight against animation. It's just kind of what's always been and, and we're here to support all of them equally but joseph uh look at you there the the release date uh, bad batch and yes oh no we got to concern concern ourselves with traveling to london and covering <laughs> that yeah no i'm thrilled about the return of uh of mandalorian of the show mm-hmm. of uh, mando and grogu uh the clan of two i'm really really excited for them to mm-hmm. to be coming back there's so many floaty dates uh or dates yeah. that shift with streaming i'm always happy when there's just an official solid uh yeah. announcement i had the 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 fact that the uh that the brazil comic-con experience was going to be a place where much much news was dropped uh, including that exciting Indiana Jones uh, news was something I was not aware of. So I'm mm-hmm. now we can all put that on our calendars of when is yeah. the Comic Con experience in Brazil? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, big news. But yeah, it's it, I feel like for Mandalorian, it, it feels like it has been quite a while. It's been you know a, about a year out from their appearance in Book of Boba Fett. It's been over two years. It will have been over two years uh, since season two of the Mandalorian. So I think it's about mm-hmm. time. Yeah, very very excited for them returning. I'm really. I know they they've announced Bad Batch for um, premiering on January fourth, uh, sixteen episodes uh, with a two episode premiere, which would say yes. There's a lot of uh, possible airing two Star Wars episodes. You know, both available at at midnight on the West Coast. Um, I really hope they shift Bad Batch. They've done it before. Um, yeah. Not even its premiere date, but just shift it to Friday once Mando starts. Uh, mm-hmm. Is is my personal preference. I think uh, in the big picture, I'm happy to have as much Star Wars as uh, <laughs> yeah. as I can get. Um, but for covering them, you know, I, I do think it might be different if you're if you're a fan. It's it may be a minor inconvenience, but certainly for those of us who cover it, I just really want to give it its own coverage mm-hmm. um, and really give it the the respect in the time um, that it. It deserves. And I think even if I didn't have a Star Wars podcast, if I was just a, uh, not just a fan, that sounds uh, really dismissive. And I did not mean it that way. Um, If uh, I didn't have the extra work to cover it, Mm -hmm. I would still want the time myself personally to absorb each one. Mm -hmm. Um, Like even, even with the MCU overlaps, you know, Mm -hmm. Miss Marvel and Kenobi being at the same time, like normally I would have made Miss Marvel like a priority. My wife and I would have watched it. Uh, that night and it had to wait weeks because Kenobi took up uh, sort of so much uh, <laughs> time and emotional space. So yeah. I really hope they shift uh, Bad Batch. Yeah, no, these are these are uh, on the surface, of course, uh, easy problems to have in, in our lives. But it's not just about even the podcast side, but the business side, because this does factor in. We, we will get those reports on num- numbers and this thing didn't do as well. And this thing and, and, and there's all these things to consider. So it definitely is part of the business conversation. I'm with you. Two on, um, you know, giving Bad Batch its due. 
as, as I said, you know, yes, animation might come to, come across as, as, as the second tier of Star Wars shows only because I think it's just how it's still viewed, not just in Star Wars, right? But I mean, we still have executives going, ah, you know, we, we got to give the parents something when the cartoons are on. Like that kind of vibe <laughs> is still out there. So anything we can do to help change that and, and, and Bad Batch is really a rich and, and wonderful uh, show. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm excited. As far as Manda coming back March 1st, uh, that date is... Closer than I want it to be uh, in terms of life. Uh, but yeah, I, I feel I'm, you know, I'm getting excited for that. And, and Mando is a, a show that I, I've always really liked and, and loved bar- parts of. But I think that that two year absence and yes, Book of Boba Fett's there. Part of that continuation of that uh, universe and that story. But I'm with you, Joseph. I'm I, I just excited to kind of go uh, swashbuckling through the West in space again, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. The other thing about about um, two Star Wars shows on the same day is, you know, there's there's that question of what fans think. And I know when this co- has come up before, we've gotten you know responses on social media where some people are like, I really don't like that, and other people be like, I don't care, give it give it to me on the same day. But I think it actually really matters from a business perspective since we know so much of yeah. their analysis that we're doing right now is from these sort of engagement tracking systems that aren't even about views. They're about how much are they being talked about mm-hmm. on social media. And I think having these two shows go up against each other is sort of unfair to the metrics of Bad Batch because we're it's yeah. not going to get as much engagement on social media. Yeah, it, it's it's playing behind the eight ball uh, without a doubt. And uh, well, well, we'll do our best to tweet it out <laughs> and get those Bad Batch hashtags, hashtag gonky. Uh, get, get them going. There's a lot of other information out there. It's kind of Mando news in the first part of our show today. Uh, a lot of it emerging from this Comic-Con experience in Brazil. Other just information that's out there. Now uh, WGA, which this, it's so it's been covering like the movie news quotations around that for about 10 years or so. Uh, and I don't ever remember where like the WGA released credits and that was a story. And it is a story, but like it just changed that we're in this world of like that's a source of information. And we've got uh, this confirmed. I, this was just maybe more for me. Confirmed there will be eight episodes. I had never doubted it was, but to see, okay, yeah, yeah okay, you definitely got eight. They're not seeking nine and they're not going to seven. Uh, once again, this show is going to be written mainly by John Favreau uh, with Noah Clore, who I think has been his writer's assistant working with him on some of the other shows, got some writing credits in Book of Boba Fett. He has a co-writing uh, credit on episode three. And Dave Filoni will be the co-writer in episodes four and seven, or is currently credited. So uh, this is not a surprise. This show is not a typical um, writer's room type of show. You see that word thrown out a lot. There's some uh, conversation around uh, the show and the writing credits. So we want to talk a little bit about it. But, uh, Jen, start with you, Thart, on the uh, the writing credits. But we will point out that all of the directors have not been fully revealed or confirmed. Carl Weathers, Bryce Dallas Howard, I think they're back. And... Filoni, but it's like, we don't have that list yet. So we're just concentrating on the writers, but the directors do matter in this show. Right, Jen? Absolutely. I mean, I think when I think about the writers, I think this is the writer's room. It's kind of become a buzzword. Mainly, it seems like after Andor, um, because people were like, that's why it works so well. It's because you had so many different writers. Well, yeah, because there were a lot more episodes, first of all. It's a different style of show. Um, With Mandalorian, you know, I I think that it it works well with just having a a smaller, quote unquote, writer's room, a smaller group of people working on this. They have a vision and the directors come in and then they collaborate with those directors. And the directors are kind of like the, I don't want to say the stars. But like they definitely like shepherd it in a way that feels a little bit more like they put their stamp on it as opposed to and or it was just more about the execution of the material on the page. Um, I'm guessing with Dave Filoni being on episodes four and seven, it could have like an Ahsoka storyline that could tie in with the Ahsoka series. Kind of like what we saw with the Book of Boba Fett um, yeah. with the Mando episodes. Mm. I think that could work really nice. Um, get some hype around Ahsoka. <laughs> uh, and, you know, Noah, Noah Clore helped write the Mando episode in the Book of Boba Fett, which was a phenomenal episode that everyone loved. So I think that that's exciting. Um, I'm just, I'm excited. I, I don't have a problem with this, this small group of people, you know, taking on the show. I think people forget it is really good. It's why those those Mando episodes really stood out in the book of Boba Fett. It's like, oh, that's right. I love these characters. I love this story mind storyline. There's so much to mine with uh, Mando, and so I don't know. I, I I think once the show gets going, people are going to start getting excited again, and they'll forget about this writers' room talk. Yeah, yeah, and, and look, we want to be 
clear when we're discussing it. A lot of times you're seeing it brought up on online of uh, just, hey, wanting to get more voices in there. And that is mm-hmm. not a bad thing. That is not something we are against at all here. So I want to be clear. But like uh, to echo what Jen's saying, I, I do believe this term writer's room, it, it, it gets talked about online by people who are writers. So they very much understand the term and the word and what that actually is. And but it just kind of seeps on out where even the term showrunner, I always say it was, I didn't grow up with that term. You had them, didn't really call them that. And right. so it, it became like celebrity showrunners is the thing, you know, yeah. uh, uh, Joseph and I had had lunch uh, recently at Smokehouse, and Mike Flanagan was there. We were like, it's a celebrity showrunner. He's, <laughs> he's there. Um, so I, I don't want to dis- diminish, diminish um, any conversations around calling for more voices, but the voices are also the directors, uh, which are uh, very much part of this show and, and, and scoping every episode. This is just uh, you know, John John's story. Uh, with Filoni's help and, 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 you know, I would love to see uh, some other people take a crack, I guess, but I, I'm not, I'm not surprised and not expecting that. And it's, it has worked so well. So I get it, but, uh, yeah, this isn't uh, 13 writers in a room, um, plotting out sitcom beats here. Uh, exactly. I guess I'll be the more <laughs> direct jerk on that. I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I really agree with what both of you are saying. To me, it's just also about not being an, an absolutist about it. I think there are different mm-hmm. kinds of creative projects. I think there are creative projects that are, you know, primarily led by one creative voice. And then all of the other sort of creative decisions are are wonderful. They're valid. They're impressive. Mm-hmm. But they're all sort of looking to this uh, small team at kind of the, the top of the pyramid for the yeah. ideas. That's kind of the story of Star Wars. We've all separated, right? Of like, yeah. Lucas has this vision, but he needs Ralph McQuarrie and Ben Burt and John Williams and all of the actors, you know, yeah. and everyone, uh, John Molo, the costume designer, of the first Star Wars, he needs all these people to make it sing, but their creative stuff is all sort of in, in service of trying to help George capture this elusive thing that's in his mind. Right. Yeah. So totally. I think you have those kind of projects and then you have a little bit more standard writer's room uh, projects. And I think writer's room's, in general, in my experience, for the the few that I've been in, but also talking to uh, many other people who are actively writers and showrunners, mm-hmm. you know, uh, friends of mine in Hollywood, a, a lot of times writers' rooms uh, are still led by one person who who mm-hmm. makes that decision. Period. Yep. Right. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. the benefit of a writers' room is. Uh, let's say Mandalorian was a writer's room and, and, and Favreau was the showrunner, the big creative swings are still going to be his. What is helped by writer's rooms, and I think what people are concerned by is sometimes within the room, somebody can go, hey, showrunner, mm-hmm. even though I know you want to take this creative swing, I, I think that maybe you don't understand from from your perspective that that might be interpreted these ways or it's reinforcing this trope. Mm-hmm. And then it's up to the showrunner to go, oh, hey, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I won't yeah. do that. But I think we're still seeing plenty of examples where people are bringing those things up in writer's rooms and the showrunner is still going, cool, I still want to do my thing. That's yeah. exactly um, what I want to say. There's still that hierarchy. You're still, you know, there's still those power, those power uh, levels where they can voice it all they want. But at the end of the day, like you're saying, the the top person has the ultimate say. I, and I think that's what's different, you know, not to spiral into a different conversation, but I just want to throw this out here because the name is, you know, now tied to Star Wars. I think that's what's maybe different about what's going on with Damon Lindelof. Like when he mm. took on The Watchmen and wanted to make it a story about the original graphic novel dealt with many things ab- about the nature of uh, of America and storytelling, but it didn't deal with race a lot. And he wanted this to be about, let's add that component to the story of Watchmen. So I think he did actually... Uh, you know, tr- truly be, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm facilitating this, but I'm really listening to the voices because I know they must be in this room for this yeah. story to be told. Mm-hmm. Um, I yeah. think that's an example of a writer's room that is evolving a little bit from, from showrunner being leader decider to showrunner being facilitator. I'm going to make sure that this yeah. is, 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 I'm going to guide this through the process, but I'm really going to let other creative voices in on the actual decisions. Mm-hmm. So, I think there's a lot of, of uh, wiggle room in what, what, what writer's room means, what it brings. Mm-hmm. Um, I think uh, I'll wrap this up. I'm, I apologize. Uh, I think, I think this has Mandalorian has always been a show where Favreau is the main voice. Filoni is there with him. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is a very distinct style because mm-hmm. of that. Cause it has that distinct creative uh, direction. And, and I'm fine with having that distinctive style, especially since there's, uh, going to be more flavors at the Star Wars buffet, like we're seeing with, with Andor. Mm-hmm. Um, 
every once in a while, I do think there are maybe some cultural issues that pop up that we've all discussed m- many times mm-hmm. in, in uh, Favreau's work that might benefit from a more diverse group. But I also don't want to throw all the directors under the bus. The directors are there. Uh, the cast is there. And, you know, I really don't think that we should forget this really big announcement at Star Wars Celebration that Rick Famayiwa is an executive producer mm-hmm. on season three. And I think that is much like with Robert Rodriguez in Book of Boba Fett saying, we want you to be here making these big decisions with us all the time. Yep. So I'm really excited because I think Rick Famayiwa's episodes are phenomenal. Uh, I think his other films are phenomenal. I'm really interested to see what his voice is going to bring. And I don't think we should forget that announcement in this discussion. Um, no, absolutely. Well said. And look, it's a, another buzzword out there is nuanced, right? But it, this is the <laughs> I'm into a news conversation. But even the book of Ovid stuff, which I, I do think took some some missteps, but then you listen to, you know, Tim Morrison talk about it. And, and I think he, he had a lot to say about what was going on in there, too. And a lot of it was his story. And it's like, it, that's just kind of complicated where we're, nature where we're at. But yeah, I, I, I second you on all that writer's room doesn't necessarily fix it. But I think the, the the spirit of what people might be saying with that is what we're acknowledging is, yeah, that's, that, that's something we're behind and understand. Mm-hmm. Um, but that there are you know, other voices in that process over a Mandalorian, including, like you said, Rick from here, such a fan of his episodes in the Mando, right? They're just some of the best things. Uh, mm-hmm. And he'll have his uh, fingers are there. Bryce Dallas Howard coming back. It's a truly collaborative process over there. And you get the sense that Favreau is, he's really, he wants, he likes that team of directors around him. Just look at those, those first behind the scenes episodes. He's got his, he's got his team he brought in and <laughs> I think he enjoys that. So uh, it's all there. But again, we also want to acknowledge there's some bigger conversations, bigger things going on, but uh, we uh, also uh, really like what uh, the show's done so far. So we'll, we'll live in all the worlds right now and try to acknowledge all of the uh, voices out there if we can. Uh, additionally, there was a, a lot of talk about surprises and keeping secrets at Comic-Con Experience Brazil. Uh, Pedro Pascal was there. Favreau and Filoni uh, zoomed in. Um, <laughs> and we both busy. And they were all talking about kind of the same thing. Uh, Grogu season one, Luke Skywalker season two. They were kept secret. All those previous season reveals there. And more are on the way. There's a story about it. But again, we don't know. There's not like they're saying, you know, Crix Maidine shows up. It's not like that. <laughs> um, there's not one big surprise in regards to a character or setting. They all talked about the scope of this se- season being the biggest yet, which makes sense as the show grows and grows and grows. Epic, said Pedro P- Pascal uh, live on stage there. So what do we think about the show getting bigger in scale? And what do you think that means in terms of surprises? Maybe it is a character. Uh, maybe it is Han. Uh, we've got some great example of de-aging of Harrison Ford out there right now. Uh, what is it? Any wild thoughts? Any thoughts on what the show is, Jen? Yeah, I'm I'm excited. I don't know if it was intentional or not, but I think it's good that Favreau said that, you know, this this is going to be uh, the scope of the show is going to be big. Right. There's going to be a lot happening, a lot of surprises, because one of the reasons that some people pitted Andor against the Mandalorian or the Mandoverse is because they're saying, you know, Andor felt bigger in scale because they had a giant set built for Ferrix and they shot on location and Favreau's coming out saying, don't worry, guys. It's going to be fun. I promise. (laughs) This show is going to be great. And I believe him uh, because like I said, you know, that Mando episode in the Book of Boba Fett, whoo, that was Mm -hmm. fantastic. It reminded me of how epic it is. Um, I just want to say one last thing. Also, uh, like the directors play an important part in the Mando verse. That's how we got Deborah Chow to be able to then become the director and the showrunner for Obi-Wan Kenobi. So I think that they take, uh, that they're really trying to diversify. Maybe they could, you know, work on it in in the writing area, but certainly like behind the scenes, executive producing and also directing. I think it's a, an important piece. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyways, that's that. <laughs> no, I, I agree. And just to, yeah, to go, go back to that conversation for just a second, uh, yeah, that uh, I do think Favreau is clearly like, this is project has always been like, yeah, I'm going to, I got this idea. Oh, Filoni does too. Okay. We'll, we'll work together. But everything we've seen Favreau say is really about empowering people, right? Yes. He, he wants to have other people play in his sandbox. He's clearly the kind of creator who maybe every once in a while he's like, no, I'm real rock solid on this but he's listening to other people's opinions. That's clear mm-hmm. just from the behind the scenes. That's clear from the way he talks. So uh, I, yeah. I don't want to, you know, throw old, old Favreau under the bus. I think that he <laughs> is really trying to be somebody who is interesting in bringing more people into this world. Yeah. And mentoring. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Oh yeah. Big on that. Big on that. Yeah. Uh, this is a, yeah. Uh, sorry, Jen, if any, any, any final thoughts there on the Epic scale? I should, uh, on the Epic scale? Uh, no, I'm excited. I think, I think that they also probably got some more money. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I think that's going to help as well. Right. Um, so I have no doubt. I mean, that trailer was, was fantastic. So yeah. I'm, I'm excited. I think, I think everyone's going to be excited once the show comes out. Yeah, once uh, additional footage in a trailer or something uh, comes out, there's that one already out there now, which is great. And it, it is epic, Joseph. It's got uh, a bigger scale indeed. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I feel like I didn't see them zooming in, but, you know, did did Favreau literally do the the money thing where you make an individual bill fly out of your hand? Like, yeah, I think <laughs> I think that is a part of what they're talking about. I think um, just the literal amount of money, the scale of effects, uh, the literal number of performers in Mandalorian armor. I feel like the trailer already did announce this, that it is going to be uh, bigger in financial scope because they are telling a bigger story like Mm -hmm. i I think that's clearly always been the plan in the first season started out you know with the tight budget but with a a a smaller scale of storytelling and this is now exploding and i think Mm -hmm. uh that's great because it's it's exploding in terms of the scope of what does it mean to be a mandalorian Mm -hmm. if that was din's question from the get-go the i feel like a part of the first season is for from din's perspective being a mandalorian is being somebody who saves children of being a savior and he couldn't bear not being seen that way by Grogu. So that, that Mm -hmm. story has always been on the table of what it means to be a Mandalorian. Now we've got this story set up where next to Grogu, the thing that matters most to, to Din is being a Mandalorian. Mm -hmm. His his leader has told him he's not. And he's got this, uh, you know, this mission to, to find the living waters beneath the mines of Mandalore. He's heading towards this sort of mythic rebirth which would be plenty, except for he's also got that dark saber, which symbolizes leading all <laughs> of Mandalore. So I feel like this great question that Din's always been wrestling with mm-hmm. has been escalated of uh, who, what does it mean to me to be a Mandalorian? And oh, now my personal journey to define that uh, affects Grogu and it affects the entire future of who the Mandalorians are going to be, where we're going to live, yeah. what we're going to believe in. Are we going to be a unified culture? Oh, is all that my responsibility too? So yeah. I feel like the literal scope of his journey has expanded. So it's mm-hmm. great that the the budget, the scale mm-hmm. of storytelling that we can see is going to reflect that. Yeah, I love everything you say in there and just even some of the shots and, and, and going into Mandalore, all that kind of stuff that we're expected. I think I am most excited, though, for the the little big question with with uh, Katie Sackhoff's Bo-Katan in there of, of uh, representing the, yeah, yeah, you ain't nothing but a cult child. Let me tell you how it is, because I was there type of thing. And where were you? That is some big stuff. That is as mm-hmm. epic for me as space battles, which they're saying we're going to have um, – you know, bigger locations, the locations we might know, new locations to learn. I, I want to, more than anything, hear that conversation between them. We've seen some teases in the trailer, her on that throne. Kind of the, where were you? I, I, that is that is emotionally epic. And had, going back to Mando, Mando chapter one, chapter two, the family episode chapter two is still one of my favorites because it starts asking those questions. The IG-11 rebuilding seed is still the core of the show and reprogramming yourself, rebuilding, moving forward, breaking cycles, all those big themes we talk about. I think it's it's going to be big in that scale as well. So if if the the stagecraft can match it, even better. <laughs> even better. Uh, any any uh, specific wild surprises, Joseph? Do you want to go ahead and say the nine numb showing up or what do you think? <laughs> yeah, no, I think um, I think that we should, this is one of those examples where the, the headline should really be uh, taken with the actual text. Because <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. they, they say this specific quote, uh, not everything is going to be a big surprise like that, referencing Grogu and Luke Skywalker, but each week it should be something unexpected happening. So I, mm-hmm. I think the, the surprises they're talking about are not necessarily, you know, the here's a new character, you know, here's a legacy character, you know, um, mm-hmm. the, the thing that some fans are going to criticize is the the cameo of the week that some fans mm-hmm. uh, don't like, but more the uh, emotional surprises. Uh, mm-hmm. That said, I kind of tried to go through like, who is, who is alive <laughs> in this era? Who makes sense if Mandalore's trying to figure out what it's going to be? I, I, my mind really goes to New Republic, right? They've already had the mm-hmm. presence of the New Republic be a big thing. But if Mandalore is returning to power in any way, shape, or form, not the planet, but the people, mm-hmm. if they're unifying, becoming part of the galaxy again, 
the first question is, are they going to be a part of the new Republic? <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, and so, I mean, the, the big surprises that I can think of Shriv, <laughs> Zinger Rath Velas from yeah. the aftermath novels, yeah. members of alphabet squadron. Um, I, I suppose they, they could go for CGI Leia. I kind of, don't know about that yeah um so so. uh, my mind goes to new republic and then you know there are other Mm -hmm. things like could there be a satine flashback where we see satine in live action um Mm -hmm. right right could a surviving jedi like quinlan voss show up but but these are all like Cobb vanth kind of for for all in paying attention to star wars of all media kind of things they're not like yeah yeah, de-aged han solo which Mm -hmm. i I don't think uh, who knows Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, anyway. I gotta, yeah, I got to say, I, I don't, I to the like the Leia question, even the Hans Han question. Like, look, if they do a Han and Chewie showing up, I, I bet you I'd be excited. I'm gonna go ahead and say <laughs> I'd be excited. Uh, but I, yeah, I'm with you. I, it's not that I, I don't want to say I don't want that. That's a dangerous thing to say. But I just doesn't, don't get the sense that that's what they're thinking about. And um, in terms of surprises, yeah, the situations, planets, uh, Coruscant, uh, any kind of big planet mm-hmm. like that. That's kind of the thing I, I want too. But yeah, I love what you're saying too. If like. Like Cobb Vanth was a Cobb Vanth is still a great example of just like it's a small side character, but with a big thing, the Boba Fett armor. So that kind of makes sense. But you know, a lot of those characters, the Nora Wexley, you know, who young Tamman Wexley, yeah. I don't know, something like Wedge, you know, I can <laughs> pass to a younger Wedge. There's a lot of things like that that could work because of the timeline. I'm I'm intrigued by that. Hey, look, not for nothing. Give me Genevieve O'Reilly's Mon Mothman episode. Exactly. I don't, you know, have the mm-hmm. goats show up. That's something that people think. Uh, especially with Filoni around going, hey, look, here's what we got going on in Ahsoka. So, uh, yeah, well, there'll be some synergy, some storyline synergy, I think, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I know it will have the the debate about other characters showing up. But for me, I think, you know, Favreau and Filoni have been clear that this was always their plan with Mandalorian to start small and to have this guy who kind of doesn't understand or know the big galaxy kind of fall into it, find himself in it, get caught up in all of these uh, big stake uh, conflicts and, and I think that they've been really great about every character who shows up is there to serve Mando and Grogu's story and I think that will continue if it's a small character from a video game or if it's Leia Organa I think they'll be there to serve Din and Grogu's story uh, I think we agree with that as well all right we are going to take a quick break uh, but before we do have our four center recommends an audiobook we think you should try out on us, Joseph, this one's on my bookshelf right now. I've got a bookmark in it. I've been reading it. What's our choice? <laughs> uh, the dust jacket's off. I'm going to read it this week. Uh, we are still recommending Padawan by Kirsten White. We've made lots of jokes about how often we've been recommending this one. We've just fallen behind. We really want to read it. We're really excited to read it. So we hope uh, if you're listening and you want to read it, that you've read it or you're going to listen to this audiobook. Yeah, absolutely. To do so, download your free audiobook today by going to audibletrial.com slash four center. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash four center for your free audiobook. All right, quick break. On the other side, we got some acolyte news. That's right. There's another show on the way that people are looking forward to, us included. Stick around for more news here on Four Center. Welcome back to Force Center. We are taking a look at the Star Wars news of the week. And we talked about Mando coming back March 1st. That's exciting. Well, a little bit later in our lives, we're going to be uh, enjoying the uh, debut of Leslie Headland's series. Speaking of showrunners and running rooms and all that good stuff, uh, we got her series, The Acolyte. A little bit of news dropped and we wanted to talk about it. First, there's another member to the ever-growing cast. A lot of cool names. Deadline reporting the addition of Margarita La Viva. Uh, that's how I'm saying it, even though she's, uh, Jen, and you and I were talking before. She's uh, She's got a Russian heritage, right? So yes. I, should, I should know what to say. Though. That, that is, you know, <laughs> Ukrainian Circassian being in my blood. I should be able to say it a little better than that. But yes, she's, uh, this is a smaller in scale casting addition. This is a guest starring role. She's appeared in shows like The Deuce, Revenge, How to Make It in America, a full uh, resume out there as well. So thoughts on the growing cast of this show first, Jen? This was a move by her new reps at Paradigm 
to get her some buzz because that was <laughs> that was how the announcement was led, right? That she's mm-hmm. now joined, now rep by Paradigm in all areas. Oh, and by the way, she's mm-hmm. also guest starring on this new Star Wars show, um, which is wonderful. I I feel like maybe I've seen her before. She was in Adventureland. I saw that, mm-hmm. oh, I, but I don't I don't remember her. But she has worked a lot. So, um, and I checked out her Instagram, and she has kind of a really fun energy, but she can definitely go into serious drama. So that's exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the acolyte seems like it has a big cast so i'm kind of thinking that we're going to get more of these announcements uh yeah. these guest star announcements from agents and managers um trying to get some publicity for their for their clients which is wonderful mm-hmm. but at the same time it makes me think well they might have one episode you know they yeah. may have like a couple scenes which is yeah. fine but I, I i don't want to get too excited with any of these announcements i'll have to wait and see yeah no it's a good look it's uh this is Often, again, even talking about the, that term writer's room, yeah, a term guest star um, is um, a specific term uh, in Hollywood there. So it's exciting. And I, and I love, yeah, Jen, you're so right. It was that like, you know, that was the lead, her new agency. And then now this. But hey, we're talking about it. So guess what? No wonder they're doing it because it works. And uh, mm-hmm. this is a, an actor to celebrate, Joseph, in this show. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm very excited to just keep the announcements coming uh, about the Acolyte. Um, I'm not super familiar with his actor, uh, so there's not a like a huge amount of fireworks going off for me just because I don't know her work. Um, I really agree with you, Jennifer, <laughs> about the announcement. And I, I like that this is how Star Wars is finding its, its way into our lives. It's the, uh, <laughs> the agent manager wars are uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> getting us to see and appreciate some Star Wars news. Right. Um, yeah, I was I was going through her entire list and I was like, I've never seen her. Like, wait, I have seen this actor in the dumbest possible way. I have seen her in the television show The Deuce, oh. but only with it muted because oh. I realized The Deuce used to come on after Game of Thrones and I would mute the television while my wife and I talked about Game of Thrones and The Deuce would be playing in the background <laughs> muted. So wow. I have nothing valuable to say about this performer <laughs> other than I'm sure she's great. That's amazing. That's amazing. That's like I've seen a lot of uh, shows that Grace has watched. Uh, I've heard them, not seen them, because I'm <laughs> on the couch right. playing video games with her playing. That's uh, that's great. Yeah, no, it's exciting. And, and you're right, Jen, too. Like uh, more of these announcements probably coming. This seems like a big cast. Uh, a lot of cool people being brought into Star Wars and keeping with what Leslie had had said a long time ago. I'm going to send the elevator back down and bring up a lot of cool mm. people to this mm. thing, uh, including Daphne. Keen. So there's the story. This is uh, she was speaking with Tech Radar. Uh, the Acolyte cast member recently announced Daphne Keen said uh, the Acolyte is set 100 years before the prequel movies. This we knew. And it's kind of an explanation of how the Sith infiltrated the Jedi. Uh, it's a Sith led story, which has never been done before. So we got the description of the show uh, recently about two two Jedi former, uh, you know, apprentice coming back to investigate some stuff going on and uh, dark side powers emerging. That's been attached to the show since the beginning. We want, I want to be clear here in my notes and, and we're going to be clear for center. We are not here to doubt Daphne Keene as if she doesn't understand the, the, the use of the term Sith. Um, she has said that she said Sith twice in that sentence there. Mm-hmm. Um, but we do want to, you know, we've been talking about here is, there's a di- obviously the difference between Sith and dark side user, dark side powers emerging and the Sith with their old rule of two plan and occasional apprentices on the side and set a hundred years before the Phantom Menace that could lock you into some certain um, Sith uh, masters in canon, which Leslie Headland has said, oh, I'm a big EU fan. I'm a big Star Wars fan. So all of this could sync up. I just think it's an interesting conversation to keep having. Uh, about this idea of the, the show playing around with the dark side versus the Sith. Uh, Daphne Keene, again, I want to reiterate, not saying she doesn't understand the term. She probably understands it more than me right now because she's shooting this show. I'm just saying it was to see that so specifically used, that it's a Sith-led story. We want to talk about it there so we could take that at face value. Do we want the Sith uh, we're familiar with to show up? Or do we want new faces and new masks and new Darth showing up in this story? It's a fun conversation to continue, Joseph. And what are your thoughts on Sith led stories? Yeah, no, um, I think that I think the Sith in some way are, are clearly involved. I think I do have the, the bias that, you know, it's not an actor's responsibility to do the press for a show. Right. And and I think in, in complicated, uh, genre worlds where, where fans really are laser focused on things like what's the difference between Sith and a dark sider. And, 
even with a comment which, which was never done b- before. And I've seen people like, mm-hmm. has she not read Lords of the Sith? <laughs> right, right, <laughs> you know, right. um, so I, I do think it is always uh, it's good not to doubt actors, but I think it's also very good to give them uh, some empathy and some grace that it is not their responsibility to be the press and to parse uh, you know, jargon of genre for hyper accuracy. Um, yeah. yeah. So I, I think the Sith are going to involve, going to be involved. I'm not going to run with this and go confirmed. Uh, you know, Amanda yeah. Stenberg's character is uh, the Padawan <laughs> and she's a Sith. You know, I, yeah. I, I will, will stop short uh, of that. I, I do think um, it, it, it is making me think more about, Ooh, what's, what's the plot. If the Sith are involved, mm-hmm. you know, is it that the, the active Sith at the time are, are trying to spread confusion and in corruption. Mm. Uh, are they trying to get at a former Padawan? Right. N- mm. Not even as a part of like the master plan, but just like, mm. how can we walk through the garden of the Jedi and rot every flower, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, yeah. rot every plant. So yeah. I, I think one of the most intriguing things about that, that press, uh, you know, description we got is that it's a former Padawan retreaming with her master. So yeah. whatever happened, the, whether the Padawan is not, you know, officially with the order anymore, yeah. is, is the story that some Sith are trying to get to mm-hmm. uh, this Padawan and and turn her, and and she is, you know, somewhere in between, right? So yeah. so like the the maybe the title character isn't a Sith yet, but wants to be one. I think all those kind of ambiguities uh, are, are possible. Yeah. Um, I have some thoughts about what Sith uh, may or may not show up, but I, I don't want to monologue, Ooh. so I'm going to pause. Oh. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, Jen, go ahead. I want to know. I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Who do you think? I, well, I just want to say this because I do have some thoughts of that too, and I want I want to hear your choices there. I, I I find myself in a weird spot. I'm really excited by this. I'm really excited by a Sith led story, or at least that that term. It just I don't know. It, 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 I get I get protective. I don't want to say defensive. I get protective of maybe Star Wars itself of like. I think I think there's a a little bit of a Sith fan culture that comes pops up where it's like <laughs> yeah. finally we get this, it's that old yeah. Sith point of view thing and I, I just yeah. don't think that Leslie Headland does not strike me as a person that's about to be like uh, finally I'm going to tell the story uh, of these sympathetic uh, dark side users I, I think it's going to be something else going on clearly but I, yeah I, I'm excited by this excited by the timeline I'm just glad we don't have. Well, it's definitely Darth Tenebrous. You know, so I, <laughs> yeah, right. I don't have that. Uh, it could end up being that, but I, right now, I just I like to explore not new Sith, but just what you're kind of ta- talking about, Joseph, the walking through the garden and making everything dead. That is interesting, especially leading towards the Jedi Order and the Phantom Menace and all those things. So that's where I'll start there. But doesn't mean I don't have some thoughts on specific names or wants. And I guess Joseph will will, will get your names here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I think there's just lots of of wiggle room. I think sometimes as fans, we can focus on what we know and then forget that there's a lot that we don't know to the to the side of it. Yeah. Um, so at 100 years before the Phantom Menace, we definitely need to leave room for Sheev mm-hmm. and Plagueis, who is established as, you know, Sheev's uh, master. Mm-hmm. But at 100 years before, you know, I'd be fine with it if this is Plagueis' master. Of mm-hmm. course, in as you're talking about, Ken, in the, in the Darth Plagueis novel, uh, it was established that Plagueis' uh, master was Darth Tenebris, a Bith Sith, which is just fun to say. Oh, right, <laughs> right. Um, but Tenebris has only been mentioned in canon as one of the namesakes of Sith troopers in the sequel era. So there's nothing in modern canon that says uh, Tenebris is for sure Plagueis' master. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it could be Tenebris, right? Um or it could be a different Sith because we're not locked into uh, that. It could be mm-hmm. Tenebris if uh, Leslie Headland is a, a big fan. Um, but the other thing about it is we don't need to just focus on that like one mm-hmm. idea, right? Maybe it is Tenebris, but he's in the background as a Sith master and he has a Sith apprentice other than Plagueis because sometimes yeah. they go through a lot. So yeah. could it be that the Sith presence is something like an apprentice of Tenebris who is looking for their own acolyte to turn mm-hmm. against their master, right? Yeah. I think it, there's so much wiggle room in, even if it is something that's kind of locked into uh, Legends canon of it's Tenebris, there's still lots of ways to make it a new and unfamiliar face that's the main yeah. Sith we're interacting with. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really like this idea. There's this kind of, uh, yeah, playing around with the, 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 the wiggle room in what we do or do not know, and I'm excited to like, 
you know, I, I, I love presidential history and it's like, it, you, you got your Garfields, you know, uh, <laughs> tragically, yeah, 30 days and all, that kind of stuff. Like who's the one before Palpatine that was like, I, I signed up for two weeks. It didn't work out. You know, <laughs> just, <laughs> some room there. And I would love some familiar names, even in passing mentioning if, if that's where this show goes. There also seems there has a little bit of this, you know, thriller aspect too or it could be something else maybe it's even then you don't fully know who's behind some of it we're so far out of this jen though we're just having fun speculating uh wildly and responsibly at the same time any any do, do you do you want uh, a new darth what's your prediction <laughs> Yeah. You know, I do think it's interesting that StarWars.com did not mention Sith in their official announcement. Mm-hmm. Why? Why? And I, I think Daphne, I, I don't want to say she gave away anything, but I think that the reason why she used Sith twice is because she's, you know, working on that. Mm-hmm. So I think it, I think it is definitely, as my speculation, irresponsibly, that it is definitely a major part of the story. Uh, Leslie, as you mentioned, Leslie Headland is a fan of the Old Republic game. She's also a fan of the EU, so I think she's going to draw inspiration from those properties to create and shape her story about the Sith. Um, mm. And I think that's going to get a lot of fans excited because a lot of a lot mm. of EU fans have felt kind of slighted, um, and so I think that it's a bit of a risk, right? Because the Sith have been so kind of mysterious, and it's it's been helpful to have them be so mysterious mm. all these years. So once you start locking things in. It, uh, it can be a little tricky with canon and things like that and how it affects the Star Wars mm-hmm. saga. Uh, but I think she's the right person to do it because she she is a really hardcore mm-hmm. fan. Um, yeah. And with something this tricky, you, you kind of need somebody who is going to be able to address those, you know, those uh, uh, those things in the past and bring them and make them new so that people who have no idea who the Sith are can get on board and fans who are hardcore and who loved that will will feel satisfied. That's a challenge. Mm. It's a big challenge too. And actually, it brings something up here. This is a debate that will go, go on and on and on. And it really just depending on your point of view is how you like or dislike the answers. If you got on one side, we got Mr. Tony Gilroy. I'm not a fan. I'm not a Star Wars fan. I, mm-hmm. I think he's really a Star Wars shirts in his closet, but he's over there. And then you got like what you just said, Jen, someone who's like, yeah, I, I, oh, trust me, I'm a fan. I know. I was, I had Star Wars Insider, I, and all that stuff. And I think both can work. Clearly, both can work. Uh, the movies are an example of that. Uh, all those kind of things. Uh, you know, John Caston, fan of Star Wars. That worked mm-hmm. on this thing. So I like the Gilroy side. I get the arguments for more of that kind of stuff. But then, then on the other side, I, I for something like this, um, history that's undefined but specific history with only one or two names at a time it isn't like a uh, gilroy coming in with a lot of the, the rebellion where there's a giant amount of landscape to to move into and build on in terms of the story of the rebellion and all the planets come together like that that, that makes sense but it's it's kind of hyper specific uh, if you, if that makes sense right joseph they're just like we got some names we got some ideas and it doesn't just have to be the names we can play around with it but the 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 Sith versus Jedi at this time, uh, we want someone who's maybe like, I got this. This is my story. I'm pitching it. I know what I want to do. Exactly. Yeah, I think somebody who who is a fan, or somebody like Gilroy, who is clearly listening, right? Like yes. he's not, yes. you know, o- overturning. No, he's not just going through and saying this didn't happen. That didn't happen. <laughs> like yeah. he, he's filling in gaps and maybe changing some preconceived notions, you know. But he's not overturning things. But I think for somebody who's really invested, they probably know like, OK, yeah, of course, there's the the rule of two and the the where she starts to fit into it. That that's really important. And we don't want to mess with that too much. But what are all the the ambiguities of a, of a giant galaxy like this that can be played with? You know, I think one of the great things about the Sith is like clearly there are tons of dark siders and it is in the nature of the Sith to kind of be. <laughs> really uh, selfish and manipulative about the title, right? Why isn't Asajj a Sith? It'd be, yeah. You know, when she's fully yeah. using the dark side because mm-hmm. Dooku is holding that title back and is waiting until she's powerful enough to make his move against Palpatine, right? So there's there's plenty of wiggle room to have like a great new character who's running around calling themselves a Sith, <laughs> you know, because they, they say they are, right? Um, yeah. Or it could just be Sith cultists, right? A pocket yeah. of Sith cultists who've got a hold of this Padawan and they're telling mm-hmm. her this is what it takes to be a Sith, you know? Oh, here, here we go. We, the fans, have a specific relationship with what the actual title is, what the history is, who, you know, who's got the badge mm-hmm, <laughs> for mm-hmm. officially being in the club, 
But I think yeah. a cool thing about the club is that it's res- it, it plays games with who gets the title. Yeah, I, I love what you said. Yeah, jokes aside, maybe maybe finally we get the Sith cultists from Mexico if we get their origin story, right? No, mm. um, no, but I, no, I'm excited by that. And 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 uh, you know, this has always been pitched as a Sith led or not, it's been pitched as you got this this good team, the Jedi Order, that's collapsing, that's kind of fallen in on itself, which is where we see it. It's ready. It's primed for the fall by episode one, we're going to see that. And so it's not a glorification of the bad, bad team, the Sith. It's just showing how the bad team infiltrates the good team. That's exciting in terms of themes, in terms of lessons and the star Wars story. So uh, without specifics, we'll see how it, uh, you know, how it slides on into the whole story. I love that. Can I, can I ask a, a specific question real yeah. quick? Yeah. Um, if there is with, with all those ambiguities uh, possible, if there is just a Sith, uh, regardless of it, mm-hmm. if it's, you know, an apprentice, whatever, but there's a Sith, a straight up Sith, yeah. what kind of, in, in the characters new, what kind of thing are, are we interested in, in seeing on screen for a new Sith? What do you think, Ken? Uh, yeah. See, my mind wants to go to a Palpatine type that is using other ways, politics, the system getting in there. That's what I love about uh, Palpatine's presence in a lot of ways. He's the ultimate evil, but how he got there was so mundane, right? Um, but I would want that something different. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, fallen Jedi, um, questioning the system in a similar to Dooku, I guess, going that kind of way. But I'd like to see it someone, I think at the end of the day for, season, for me, someone that has a, a public face mm. uh, and that, that the rule of two hiding out for a thousand years doesn't mean they're in a, you know, like me playing Fortnite, hiding out in a, in a, in a <laughs> building and hopefully no, hoping no one comes until it's time to strike that they're actually out and about. They're seeing the galaxy. They know how to get in there. They know who's weak. They know where the cracks are and have a public secret face is something I'm, I think I'm excited. Whether it comes out lays, lays down, uh, you know, too close to Palpatine. I don't know, but that's kind of where mm. Yeah, of that. Yeah, I would love to see. I mean, I don't know about specifics, but I know the feeling that I want. I want to get. And one of the things I loved about Andor was that the villains, quote unquote, were quite. I wouldn't say likable, but they could be charismatic, right? Mm-hmm. I would love to see this 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 villain in the acolyte be charismatic, somebody who you may even least expect it, but just who is pure evil mm-hmm. in in little moments. To then the big reveal of who they really are. Um, I mean, that's what was so great about Palpatine is how charming he was, how he seemed like he really cared, right? And mm-hmm. you could see how everyone would be fooled. So I like that idea, like you're saying, Ken, of somebody who is like out and about, public facing, maybe even well loved, because quite mm-hmm. frankly, that's a lot more like our our world. And that to me is a little bit more interesting mm-hmm. in a villain, mm-hmm. at least right mm-hmm. now. Yeah. I, I love that. I think that's such a, a truth of what the Sith do, especially when they are trying to seduce someone to the dark side, is they're really charming. You know, we, we got to see a little bit of it with uh, Palpatine and Anakin in the actual prequel films. I, mm-hmm. I love, uh, you know, Maul and Ezra meeting and Maul pretending oh, yeah. to be an old person who's been uh, also been victimized by the cruel Sith, which he has, but he's playing it in such a way that's so manipulative. So, yeah, mm-hmm. love to have some quality time with a long manipulation. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and then for what the actual Sith looks like, I just I think a woman would be great since this is yeah. a, a, a woman led show. I would I would love uh, not that there haven't been in canon, but yeah. you know with all this talk of who who's, who's it going to be, you know I, I would love a woman. It, an alien might be great. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, just yeah. to switch it up a little bit. Uh, and I really agree with you, Ken, about the public face and the Sith face is so such a fun you know thing to play with i had forgotten that darth tenebris uh, you know is given a, a, a real uh, a real his his public facing alien name mm-hmm. <laughs> and mm-hmm. is like a famous a famous well-known ship designer you know yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah so that idea you know we've been playing with it in andor of like kind of the two faces that's just that's just fascinating so i'd love that mm-hmm. too Love it. And here's the thing. We are we are far out from the show still. Uh, time moves so fast, but we are, we're excited about this. And this is uh, already, to me, uh, a big victory for the show. Just putting some some uh, Star Wars thoughts in our head to break down. Mm-hmm. Just to wonder. That's yes. great. That's great. Well, we'll keep you all updated on the guest starring roles, the uh, leaks for management teams, and what Sith is showing up. Uh, new masks, new capes, new cows on the way. Possibly. <laughs> 
Uh, that is our look at Star Wars news. Before we get out of here, it's kind of uh, keeping in the theme here on the discussion. This week in Star Wars history, looking ahead to Star Wars Pass, on December 6, 2004, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2, The Sith Lords, was released by LucasArts and Obsidian Entertainment for the Xbox. Uh, just like news, sometimes this week in Star Wars history has slow weeks, too. There was a lot of <laughs> released in Brazil for the first time, movie, movie stuff, but this one popped out to me. Uh, it's a smaller bit of Star Wars history, but the three of us have a different relationship with these games. So this is more of a conversation about Knights of the Republic overall. Um, so what was our reaction to releases like this then? In December 2004, were, were we like, whoa, yeah, or I missed it. Um, and how come we didn't dive in? Or, or have we played them? And I, Joseph, uh, I remember you were trying to play it a little bit, if I remember, on the yeah. iPad. So. Uh, how come they didn't grab us much, if that's uh, the case? And would we play them now? Jen, I don't think I've heard your relationship with Knights of the Republic as much as I know mine or Joseph's. Yeah. Uh, you know, I did not. <laughs> <That's> it. <laughs> <laughs> I did not play it. And here's why. I, rem I remember thinking it looked cool. And it still looks cool. If you yes. watch the trailers for it now, I'm like, well, is, I might actually play this now. But I do have a problem playing games that are involve anything scary i get a little <laughs> too scared mm -hmm. to be perfectly honest and anytime i don't want to be surrounded by all of that darkness you know what i mean like i like uh i like being a rebel i like i like the good guys bad guys that kind of stuff uh this is a little bit too much of the bad guys so mm -hmm. that's i think that that's why i didn't play it then and why i might hesitate playing it now i mean i get freaked out with the legend of Zelda, my husband plays it at night, and I hear that spooky music. It gets creepy. I don't like it. Then I have nightmares, you know. So I'm a bit of a Freddy cat. I'm sorry to say. Uh, I, look, I'm Freddy cat too. There's some parts of Red Dead Redemption two, or even Red Dead Red, Red Dead Redemption one, where you kind of yeah. walk through an abandoned town, oh, and there, there's a zombie mode. I didn't, I didn't get that. I didn't oh, get no. that downloadable content for the game because I get scared. But even in some like ghostly uh, ghost towns, which there's not a soul in there, I get scared. I'm riding my horse like I got to get out of here and it's two in the afternoon. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, OK, that's a great. OK, that's a guy. I, I get what you're looking at there. Joseph, uh, you and I have talked about this before. I know you're playing, but I especially want to know of uh, younger Joseph Scrimshaw, December 6, 2004. He sees this news <laughs> and says what? Ooh, yeah, that 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 was a, an interesting time for me. That was a time of life transition uh, in 2004. So I was trying not to play video games anywhere near as much. Um, it, earlier in 2004, I had uh, broken up with my girlfriend of three years. We had lived together. And uh, one of her valid concerns was the amount I was disappearing from reality while mm -hmm. playing video games <laughs> and making them a big priority. So it was something I was trying to be aware of to find uh, find balance. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I think I've told before that I, the, the original Knights of the Old Republic, I watched like a hawk and I even got my, uh, my MacBook that had the right specs. I remember looking mm -hmm. at the specs again and again, it's like my MacBook needs to be able to run Knights of Old Republic. <laughs> and then I just had that, like, you, you can't be trusted with this <laughs> a, a video game on your computer as you're trying to kind of uh get back on the horse of life uh so that's why i wouldn't have been you know it wouldn't have been a focus for me in december of yeah. 2004 i also didn't have an xbox and it's really funny to remember you know mm -hmm. when i was playing video games a ton uh all of my friends had uh had nintendo yeah, uh, had the GameCube and we were sort of loyalists and you know it's really funny to think about now but by 2004 it was still a like Hey, you know, the, the jerks who make Microsoft Office, they're trying to shove their way into the video game market, which like, obviously they succeeded. No problem. You know, yeah, that's amazing. Uh, but I did not have an Xbox uh, nor money to get it for that. Uh, in, in terms of the Knights of the Old Republic, you know, I really there's a part of me that wishes I really jumped on, you know, back mm -hmm. in the day. I did start it on my iPad. I'm just so struggling with time. Mm -hmm. I, I have all these uh, books staring at me that I want to read and, yeah. you know, shows I want to rewatch. Uh, I can't believe I haven't rewatched Obi-Wan Kenobi, but it's, oh. it's time. And the only reason I, I said it like two days aside, you know, earlier this year, or maybe even last year and started uh Knights of the Old Republic and was really enjoying it. And I'm just struggling to make time for it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think similar. Uh, yeah, well, in terms of time frame, I mean, Sith, Revenge of the Sith was still on the way. I'm still a Star Wars fan. I, none of that. I've always been. But yeah, you know, there's those those downtimes in the fandoms, or at least our own personal fandoms. Or sometimes you're just like, yeah, yeah, I'll wait. I'll, I'll wait for episode three. I'm not going to play video games. And I was a play. I've, I'm still brand loyal to PlayStation. It's so I didn't know why. I think it's just the one I got. 
I got the PS1 and that was it. I was like, ah, I'm, I'm on this team. It's it's such a weird thing. So I didn't have the Xbox as well. I don't like playing games on the PC for a lot of reasons, but including what you're saying, Joseph, was like I already have a problem with the video game uh, console sitting and staring at me right now. Right. Where I'm like, how soon can I get off a of Force Center to go play Fortnite again? Like, it's a problem right now. And I want to thank mm-hmm. our buddy Ken Plume for getting me addicted to that again. Um, so I have to watch that too. I have to, I have to uh, mitigate my playing times here. But in terms of the game itself, I, I always feel bad. A lot of people are so excited. Uh, uh, KOTOR, or whatever you want to call it. The, uh, yes. Such a fandom for it. And our pal mm-hmm. Kevin Smets. Uh, Smets uh, Kevin Smets, a lot of you know from the Schmodown. Right? He, he edited some of our videos uh, on the YouTube channel, the Memoriams. Um, uh, he's got his own like fan film version of some of the KOTOR stuff. Every time he brings up, he's mm-hmm. got that New Stars podcast, the Scandal Sync show. He's doing that with Sully and, and Hannah and Frank Janish. Uh, and, and he'll bring it up, but there's always a part of him that his soul just kind of hangs in sadness when I'm like, yeah, I still haven't, I still haven't played it or I haven't watched this. <laughs> and I don't know why. I, I, I'm excited. I think I read that first Darth Bane book, the Drew Carpetian one, and that was 2014. And then the new canon started and was like, well, I guess I have to not have to put down those books, but I have to start focusing on this stuff. Um, including for Jedi Alliance uh, and then for eventually Force Center. So I think I could have been more into it, but I got pulled away. And so I've just kind of <laughs> waited for the official canon version of it as well. But it's a wonderful mm-hmm. world, always respectful. But it's I saw this news story and I just was kind of laughing of like, yeah, I was uh, I was alive and well during this time, had Star Wars things on my shelves, but this story just did not, not a blip on my, on my radar <laughs> in 2004. So yeah. And, and would I play it now? Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe. It's right. a big world. It's a big world. Yeah, the 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 new problems and the old problems are the same. As the, we're getting mm-hmm. news about, you know, uh, Star Wars Jedi Survivor allegedly coming out in March, and I need to buy an entirely new console. Oh, for yeah. it. it's, it's, if it's, I can it's, find it. Yeah, or the PS the search for the PS Five. I got very lucky, so we'll have to uh, we'll have to put the call out to Four Center friends to help uh, get Joseph a link. Today. <laughs> it, it was the weirdest concept for me. Yes, uh, yes, I saw. Yeah, by the way, yeah, the, that leaked news possible uh, March for Jedi Survivor and Jedi Order Survivor, and I, I my head looked literally kind of hung down. I was like, I don't have the time. Yeah, I don't have the time, but I'm excited. So yeah. All right. All right. Well, 20 years from now, we'll look back on uh, Jedi or Jedi Order Survivor when it came out in uh, Force Center there in the future. All right. We are almost out of here for today. We want to thank you all for hanging out, listening to us here. Uh, before we go, let you know where you can find us on Twitter. It's Force Center Pod. We are on Hive Social at Force Center. I Is Hive back up right now? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Facebook page is Four Center Podcast. We're on Instagram and YouTube as well. As we said up top, we'd really appreciate it. If you want to come on board the YouTube side, uh, subscribe as we've got some YouTube only content coming uh, that over there soon. And also got a lot of things up there for you to watch, including those in memoriams. Go back and watch them with Kevin Smith. We put those together uh, for Spotlight Star Wars and I pulled them off of those and put them on the YouTube channel. They're out there as uh, well. Um, uh, fun things uh, to work on with Kevin. Uh, podcast is available on Acast, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and more merch available at tpublic.com slash user slash force center. Get your Speculate Responsibly uh, t-shirt <laughs> so you too can uh, speculate responsibly about Sith Lords. Patreon.com slash force centers where you can support us and get to our Discord server. Uh, you can follow me at Cadnapsock or go to cadnapsock.com for upcoming information. Holiday season, if you want to get a copy of Why We Love Star Wars, signed by me, personalized with a sticker. I'll throw on some stickers. Go to my website and the shop section there. Jen, where can they find and follow you? You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook at Jennifer Landa, YouTube at Jennifer Landa, where I have new videos every week. Mm-hmm. TikTok, where I post director's cuts at Jennifer Landa 1138. <laughs> um, yeah, and Hive Social, according to Twitter, according to their Twitter, they're not back, but they'll be back soon. So you can follow me when they're back up at Jennifer mm-hmm. Landa on Hive. Uh, it's, uh, that's interesting. Yeah. Hey, they're getting it right. Security concerns, you got to get it right. That's how the Sith get into the Jedi Order. <laughs> uh, where can I find and follow you? Uh, you can follow me on social media at Hive when it's back, uh, and uh, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, all is at Joseph Scrimshaw. And you can check out uh, my YouTube channel. You can just go to YouTube and search for Joseph Scrimshaw. I'm posting my uh, not unboxing uh, 
for Star Wars action figures and other action figures uh, is YouTube Shorts. Uh, and I'm putting up more uh, short films and comedy soon. Like I said, I'm working on a couple things that are going to pop up there. And, uh, and if you are the Patreon type, you can also uh, search for Joseph Scrimshaw on Patreon if you want to help me with those short films. That is it for me. That is it for Joseph, for Jennifer, for everyone here. So for all the Sith, just kind of line away. We'll see you next time here on Force Unleashed.